We want to recognize uh, ISI, the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. They actually have a whole s debate series going this year on the general question of what is the role of government in a free society. And then they particularize um, moral issues under that. And the one that we're debating tonight or, or we're listening to a debate on is the question, is abortion morally justifiable in a free society? And in, in, we also would like to acknowledge the Arthur Roop Foundation. As that foundation and ISI are the primary sponsors, and the Yale Political Union and Clay are student co-sponsors. Our two debaters tonight are uh, on the affirmative Professor David Boonin, who received his PhD at the University of Pittsburgh and has been teaching at um, Colorado University Boulder since 1998. His area of interest is ethics, applied ethics, and the history of ethics, especially Hobbes. He's the author of Thomas Hobbes and the Science of Moral Virtue, and also the author of A Defense of Abortion. He will be, as I say, assuming the affirmative. The other debater is Professor Peter Kreeft. He's a professor of philosophy at Boston College. He is a regular contributor to several Christian publications and is in wide demand as a speaker at conferences and is the author of over 40 books, including Handbook of Christian Apologetics and Fundamental, Fundamentals of the Faith. Professor Kreeft will be assuming the negative. The format is for the debate will be as follows. Um, there will be an opening affirmative statement of 15 minutes, an opening negative statement of 15 minutes, an affirmative rebuttal of five minutes, a negative rebuttal of five minutes, a second affirmative rebuttal of five minutes, a second negative rebuttal of five minutes, an affirmative question for the opponent, and a negative response to the affirmative question of five minutes, a negative question for the opponent, and an affirmative response to the negative question of five minutes. And there will be then a negative closing of five minutes, an affirmative closing of five minutes, and there will be 20 minutes given over to audience questions. 90 minutes in all. So, let us begin with the opening affirmative statement. Thanks. Um, I think I should start with just sort of a quick warning. I have this habit of answering questions indirectly. And so, with respect to tonight's topic, when I think of the problem of abortion, um, I think the fundamental question is basically this. Under what conditions, if any, does the fetus have the right, morally speaking, to make use of the woman's body if the woman doesn't want the fetus to be using her body? So uh, in that sense, the question about abortion is fairly specific. Um, but my habit, and I'm going to indulge myself uh, this evening, is to answer these sorts of questions indirectly. When I look at that question, I see it as a specific instance of a more general question. The more general question is this. Uh, under what conditions, if any, do any of us have the right to make use of other people's bodies if those other people don't want us to do so? So what I'm going to do, if you'll indulge me, is I'm going to take a few minutes first to talk about that general question. What I'm going to try to do is give an answer to that question based on considerations that I think most people, regardless of their views on abortion, accept. And then once I've gotten that general answer to that general question, I'm going to talk a bit about what it implies for the case of abortion. Okay, so um, this is a fairly general question. I think it's going to be helpful to have a specific sort of case in mind. So um, can people hear me okay? I don't like these microphones. I'm going to stand back. Okay, uh, so here's the case. I have contracted a fatal disease, okay? And I'm going to die unless I get some bone marrow. And the hospitals have searched the records around the world, and they found there's only one person in the world 
who has the appropriate bone marrow type. And um, it's this guy in the back of the room there. His name is Chad. I met briefly earlier. You want to wave your hand so everyone can see who you are? Thanks. Okay. So, um, so the situation is this. Um, if I get some bone marrow from Chad, I'm going to live. If I don't get some bone marrow from Chad, I'm going to die. And the process for extracting the bone marrow from Chad, unfortunately, is pretty unpleasant and painful. And unfortunately for me, Chad says, no go. Okay. Um, so it'd be nice of me, he says, if I were going to keep you alive, but I, I don't want to make that sacrifice. So the following question that occurs to me, morally speaking, would I have the right to take his bone marrow anyhow? Could I force myself upon him and take his bone marrow against his will if I needed it to go on living? Would I have the right to that bone marrow? So um, it might help me before I move on. Raise your hand if you're inclined to say, yes, I would have the right to do that. OK, raise your hand if you're inclined to say, no, I wouldn't have the right to do that. OK, let me just breathe a sigh of relief. <laughs> OK, uh, I didn't have a backup plan if it didn't go that way, so OK, good. Um, I'm going to assume that you're all right, uh, except for that one brave soul in the front, uh, and that, uh, in fact, I wouldn't have that right. So the question now is going to be, well, what, what follows from this? And um, well, here's one thing that might follow. What might follow is a quite strong claim, and the strong claim would be this. Um, Any time there's a person A who needs person B's body to go on living, Person B always has the right to decide whether or not to provide that life support, OK? If you think of letting someone else use your body as a form of good Samaritanship, the principle basically says, you get to decide whether you're going to be a good Samaritan. So I'll be referring to this as the voluntary Samaritanship principle, OK? So again, one possibility is that very strong, robust principle is true. You always get to decide. In a free society, as the resolution says, uh, you get to decide whether to be a good Samaritan. Um, for my purposes, I don't think it's going to be necessary that the principle be that strong. So I'm going to briefly mention three sorts of worries that might be raised about this principle. And I myself am a bit unsure what to say about a few of them. But I'm going to go ahead in each case and accept a certain sort of weakening of the principle, because I think I can still get to the conclusion if I want to, uh, even if I do that. So um, here's the first sort of worry. The first sort of worry concerns the the cost to the person who's being asked to provide the support, OK? So in the version of the story that I started with, I said, um, it's going to be a pretty unpleasant, painful procedure uh, that Chad's going to have to undergo. Now, suppose I change the story a little bit, and I say, actually, I can get all the bone marrow that I need from Chad, and it's just a tiny little prick. It's just sort of like a little pinch. Oh, you know, it hurts for about a second, and that's it. OK, so we change the story. So in this case, the cost to Chad is basically trivial uh, for me to get the bone marrow that I need. All right. So then we can ask the question, well, under those circumstances, if the cost to the provider of assistance is trivial, uh, would he still have the right to say no or not? OK, um, in that case, I think people can sort of go in two different directions. On the one hand, um, it's pretty difficult to imagine saying, you know, morally speaking, it's OK if he decides not to save me. It's going to cost him virtually nothing. Um, on the other hand, it is his bone marrow, right? It's not, it's not my bone marrow. So um, I think it's open to someone to say, even in that extreme case, strictly speaking, he has the right to say no. Um, for my purposes, I don't think I need that claim. So I'm going to go ahead and accept this first weakening of the principle. Okay, So now the principle is going to say, person B is free to say no, assuming that the cost is not trivial. Okay, If the cost is trivial, then we're going to leave it open. Maybe he doesn't have the right uh, to say no. Okay. Um, Second modification concerns the notion of consent. Okay? The way I told the story, there was no indication that Chad had done anything to agree ahead of time to provide me with his bone marrow. Right? Um, but let me change the story a second time. So I say, um, last week, Chad made a promise to me. He said, I promise next week I'll let you have some bone marrow. Or he wrote it down and signed the statement. Okay. Um, now the week has passed, and he's having second thoughts. You know. The needle looks kind of scary. I think I want to back out. Okay. Um, would Chad have the right to back out under those circumstances? And that's a somewhat difficult question. On the one hand, uh, the courts, for example, in this country, I think pretty clearly, would never enforce an agreement of that sort. Right? So I mean, if Chad had agreed to sign over his car, and then he changes his mind, I can send a repo man to get my car back. Right? Uh, but if Chad promised he was going to give me some bone marrow, and then he backs out, no court would ever order him right, or authorize a doctor to uh, forcibly extract the bone marrow. Um, on the other hand, some people have the view that, look, part of what freedom includes is the freedom to give up some of your freedom. So there's something to be said for the thought that maybe consent is possible in that case. And again, since I think I don't have to resolve that debate, um, I'm going to go ahead and accept a second modification to my principle. And so excuse me, the second modification is going to say that in the case where uh, A needs B's uh, body to go on living, uh, B's allowed to say no, at least if the cost to B is not 
trivial, and in addition, at least, if B never consented ahead of time to provide that aid. Okay? Um, so bear with me for one final modification, and then I'll explain what all this has to do with abortion. Um, so the third modification has to do with the notion of compensation. Okay? The basic idea behind compensation is this. Um, if you wrongfully harm someone, make them worse off than they were before, you incur a debt to them, and the debt is you have to fix the harm. You have to restore them either to the level that they were at before, to some other level of comparable value, or at least as close to that level as you can come. Okay? Uh, this notion of compensation or restitution I think is pretty deeply ingrained. Most people find it pretty plausible. And so that suggests a third sort of question. So in the original version of the story I told about Chad, um, I didn't say anything to suggest that it was Chad's fault that I was sick. Okay, but let me change the story one last time. So several months ago, Chad wrongfully broke into my house, buried some toxic waste in the basement, basement of my house, uh, and that's what made me sick. And now I need his bone marrow to avoid dying. Okay, um, in that sort of case, it seems pretty plausible to many people to say that Chad owes me the use of his body because he owes me compensation. Right? If he doesn't let me use his body, he's leaving me worse off than I was prior to his wrongful act. Right? So I'm going to go ahead and accept that modification as well. So what I've done now is I've, in a threefold manner, weakened this voluntary Samaritanship principle. So let me just repeat it one more time and sort of summarize where we are, uh, and then I'll move on to the question of abortion. Okay. So um, the principle is going to say this. If A is in need of B's body to go on living, uh, B has the right to say no, at least if the cost is not trivial, B has not previously consented, and B doesn't owe compensation to A. Okay? It seems to me that that relatively weak version of the principle is virtually necessary to account for the intuition that it looked like pretty much everybody in this room had. Okay. So thanks for bearing with me. Uh, now let me move on to the problem of abortion. What does this have to do with abortion? Um, well, I'm going to make an assumption uh, that might seem somewhat surprising to some of you for a defender of abortion. Um, I'm going to assume the fetus has the same right to life that anyone else has. Okay? Uh, and it might help me to know before I move on. Um, raise your hand if you're inclined to think the typical human fetus basically has the same right to life that you and I have. Okay. And raise your hand if you're inclined to think that's not true. Okay, thanks. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and assume that the majority in the room is right here. The fetus does have this right to life. Okay, um, if that's the case, then here's the situation that the pregnant woman finds herself in, right? There's someone, a person, who needs her body to go on living, right? Just like there's uh, someone in the case of Chad, me, uh, who needs to use his body to go on living. Okay, so what does the principle that I defended a few moments ago imply about this case? Well, what it implies is this, right? This woman has a right, morally speaking, to decide whether or not she's going to allow the fetus to use her body as a means of life support, at least if those three conditions don't apply. Right? So now the key question becomes, do in fact any of those three conditions apply? So let's go through them in the context of abortion. Okay. The first condition, remember, was cost. Okay? If the cost to the individual is trivial, arguably they have to provide it, if not, not. Okay. This strikes me as a pretty simple case. Virtually all of you agreed that the costs involved in the bone marrow extraction were not trivial, but I think virtually everybody would agree that the cost involved in carrying an unwanted pregnancy to term on the whole are at least as great as the cost involved in a bone marrow extraction. So it seems pretty clear the costs involved are not trivial. Uh, we can come back to that during discussion if we want, but that, that seems fairly straightforward to me. Uh, second issue is a little bit less straightforward, consent. Okay? Uh, in rape cases, presumably it's clear the woman didn't consent to anything, but in non-rape cases, presumably the woman did consent to something. And then the question is, well, what exactly did she consent to? Okay? This is a somewhat tricky question, so let me try to give a different example just to get uh, clear. So um, suppose a woman is told the following. If you go for a walk in this particular park late at night alone, there's a significant probability you'll get mugged. Okay? Suppose this woman, fully understanding this, goes for the walk anyhow, and she does get mugged. The uh, mugger now has her purse. Um, raise your hand if you're inclined to say, because she went for the walk in the park voluntarily, she's consented to let the mugger keep the purse. Does that sound right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, what does that suggest? Well, what it suggests to me, and I think to many other people who work on uh, issues of consent, is this. Um, there's an important difference between bringing about one state of affairs and knowing that if you bring about that state of affairs, some further state of affairs may result. Okay? So in the case where the woman goes walking in the park, her voluntary act brings about a certain state of affairs, right? The state of affairs in which she is in the park alone at night, right? Has she consented to that state of affairs? Yes. 
Okay. She understood that that state of affairs might bring about a further state of affairs. Does this mean she's consented to the further state of affairs? Well, if it did mean that, then you'd have to say she had consented to let the mugger keep the purse, but presumably none of you think that. So the lesson is, when you voluntarily bring about one state of affairs, you do consent to that state of affairs occurring, but you do not thereby consent to allowing any subsequent states of affairs to occur, even if you knew ahead of time that they might occur. Okay? So getting back to the case of voluntary intercourse, when the woman has sex consensually, she does consent to a state of affairs. That's the state of affairs she helps to bring about. Okay, so there's a state of affairs in which she's having sex with someone. That's a state of affairs she has consented to. She understood that that state of affairs might lead to a further state of affairs, but she hasn't thereby consented to that further state of affairs. So she has not, in fact, consented to let the fetus make use of her, her body. Okay, um, one final condition, and that was the... Excuse me, that was the compensation condition. Um, this one's also potentially a bit tricky. I said, well, if it's Chad's fault that I need his bone marrow, then he has to help out. And in a certain sense, it's the woman's fault that the fetus needs her body, right? If she hadn't had sex, the fetus wouldn't need her body, right? Um, but you have to remember what the motivation was, the principled explanation behind the obligation, right? That was the idea that if you harm someone, you do a wrongful act that makes them worse off than they were before, then you have to restore them to that condition, okay? So the key question, and it's a somewhat subtle question, is this. When the woman engages in voluntary intercourse, does that act, the act that involves conceiving the fetus, does that act make the fetus worse off than it was otherwise? Well, no, because right, otherwise it wouldn't have existed in the first place. Right? So in the case of voluntary acts that lead to conception, it's not the case right, that the woman owes life support to the fetus as a means of compensating the fetus for some harm that she's already caused. She hasn't caused any harm to the fetus by bringing it into existence. Okay, so um, let me just try to sort of wrap things up by briefly mentioning two sorts of objections that might be raised against this argument. Um, both of these objections have the same form. They say, wait a minute, you forgot about some other condition, and this other condition clearly applies to the fetus. So let me just uh, say something about that in my last couple of minutes here. Um, so the first condition that a critic might present is this. Well, if B did the act that resulted in the creation of A, Right? then B has an obligation to provide life support to A. And since presumably in typical cases the pregnant woman did do an act that led to the creation of the fetus, then it's going to turn out she does have that obligation. Okay, so there are two basic problems, I think, with this move. The first is sort of a general principle problem, and that is it strikes me at least as an unmotivated principle. Okay, In general, we don't think that just because I've given you something, I have to give you more of it. Right? I gave you some money yesterday, therefore I'm obligated to give you money today. I gave you some pleasure yesterday, now I have to give you more. I gave you homework help last week, now I have to give you homework help today. So it's not clear in principle why it should be any different with life. I gave you life, why am I obligated to give you more? Okay? Certainly doesn't seem to work that way in the case of life extension. Right? If you save someone's life, it doesn't follow that you're then obligated to continue giving them assistance. Why should it be any different in the case of life creation? Okay? Um, at a more specific level, though, okay, thanks. At a more specific level, this principle yields implications that I think virtually everybody on both sides of the abortion debate uh, find unacceptable. So let me just pick on Chad again for, back there for a minute. Uh, so now suppose Chad is a technician in a laboratory, and what he does for a living is he takes an egg and a sperm, puts them in a petri dish, sort of shunts the sperm over to the egg, helps it fertilize the egg, and then implants the result in a woman who then becomes pregnant. Okay, so you've got a pregnant woman here. Who did the act that caused that embryo to exist? Okay, well, Chad did. Right? So according to this objection to my principle, right, that embryo now has the right to make use of Chad's body. Right? So there's all these lab techies out there, right, and all these kids growing up now results of in vitro fertilization. When they start getting sick or needing blood transfusions, they're going to get in touch with the lab techies and they're going to say, hey, you caused me to exist. I've got the right to your blood. Okay? But I think most people on both sides of the abortion debate find that an implausible implication. And then, uh, do I, okay, thanks. I just, oh, I'm sorry, am I finished? Okay, got it. I'll, I'll try to finish that off later. Thanks. There are three essential premises to the pro-life argument, and therefore three possible pro-choice rebuttals, depending on which of these three premises is denied. To be pro-choice, you must deny at least one of them, because taken together, they logically entail the pro-life conclusion. But there are three very significantly different pro-choice positions, depending on which of these three pro-life premises is targeted. And frankly, I'm not quite sure which move my opponent would make here. 
So let me set out the case. The first premise is a scientific premise. The second is a moral premise, and the third is a legal premise. The scientific premise is that the life of the individual member of every animal species, and therefore also of the human species, begins at conception. When a genetically new and genetically complete individual first comes into existence. This truism was taught in all biology textbooks in America that were written before abortion was legalized in 1972, but not by most of the books that were written after 1972. Yet the new textbooks did not appeal to a single new scientific discovery to justify their change. So the first premise of the pro-life argument is that all humans are human. Whether they're dying humans or old humans or mature humans or inconvenient humans or young humans or infantile humans or teenage humans or fetal humans or even embryonic humans. The fetus is not another species, it's a fetal human. Second, the moral premise is that all humans have the right to life because all humans are human. All humans have human nature, have the human essence, and therefore are essentially equal. The universal right to life is a deduction from the most obvious of moral rules, the golden rule, or justice, or equality, or the categorical imperative. Since you do not want others to kill you against your will, you ought not to kill them against their will. It's just not fair, not just. Finally, the legal premise is that the law must protect the most basic human rights. If all humans are human, and if all humans have a right to life, and if the law must protect human rights, then the law must protect the right of all humans to life. The one exception would be a non-innocent human who threatens the life of another human. If all three premises are true, the pro-life conclusion follows. So from the pro-life point of view, there are only three reasons anyone can be pro-choice, either scientific ignorance or moral ignorance or legal ignorance. In fact, appalling scientific ignorance, ignorance of a scientific fact so basic that nearly everyone knows it, or appalling moral ignorance, ignorance of the most basic of all moral laws, or appalling legal ignorance, ignorance of one of the most basic of all the functions of the law. Though the three kinds of ignorance are all appalling, they're not all equally appalling. Scientific ignorance, if honest, is really ignorance, rather than ignoring. It's honest. It's pitiable, but not always morally blameworthy. You don't have to be wicked to be ignorant. If it is possible to believe sincerely that an unborn baby is only a group of cells or potential life, uh, then it's possible to believe sincerely that you are not killing a human being when you have an abortion. Of course, the question remains, what is it then? If it's only a potential life, is it the undead? If it's only a potential human, is it an ape? And if you don't believe you're killing a human being when you have an abortion, why then do most mothers who abort have such terrible dreams, and why do over 70% of them deeply regret it when they're older, according to the polls? Most pro-choice arguments during the first couple of decades after Roe v. Wade was passed disputed the scientific premise. Uh, maybe this was sometimes dishonest, maybe it was honest, I can't judge that. But most pro-choice arguments today increasingly deny the moral premise. And I think that's my opponent's strategy. Uh, I'm not sure what the reason for the strategy is. Maybe pro-choicers now perceive that they have no choice here because scientific facts are not deniable, not negotiable as moral principles seem to be. Whatever the reason, I think this is a vast sea change because if this moral camel has gotten not just his nose under the tent but his torso too, I think we are in trouble. Uh, if one denies this basic moral premise, then I have a very good Hobbesian reason for being pro-life, and that's self-interest. You know the famous statement, I think it's Dietrich Bonhoeffer, they came for the Jews and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for the gypsies and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a gypsy. Then they came for the communists and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a communist. Then when they came for me, there was no one to speak up for me. Dostoevsky wrote, we are each responsible for all. John Donne said, no man is an island. Never send to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. 
I think I detect a lot of Hobbesian individualism uh, in my opponent's philosophy as distinct from any kind of communitarianism that could produce a real community. Uh, I think the camel's nose is under the tent, and it's a one-piece camel, and I will label this camel the culture of death. Uh, I don't see any argument that would justify abortion that would not also justify infanticide, active euthanasia, suicide, eugenics, genetic engineering, cloning, and harvesting fetal body parts in what Jeremy Rifkin calls the human body shop. Or even, finally, the replacement of defective or imperfect natural human beings with perfect genetically engineered artificial human beings, a la Brave New World. This would be, in C.S. Lewis's words, the abolition of man. So I think down the line, your and my survival is at stake. Remember, it's a one-piece camel. That argument is very simple. And the usual strategy of avoiding it is to say it is not simple. It is a complex issue. Uh, the argument is usually from skepticism. Most pro-choicers think that pro-lifers claim to know too much. They're too dogmatic. Uh, how dare they pontificate with such certainty and imply that all who disagree are either mentally or morally or legally challenged. So I will give an argument for the skeptic who would not even agree with the very first principles that we know what a human being is or what human rights are. It's fashionable to appeal to this kind of skepticism to justify being pro-choice. Since we do not know with certainty when human life begins, the U.S. Supreme Court argued in Roe v. Wade, therefore we should not impose restrictions. Well, the simple answer to this argument is to demand a reason why it's more restrictive to give life than to take it. Why allowing abortion doesn't impose a more severe and violent restriction on its victim than forbidding abortion does. And the only reasonable answer is that this is so because we know that the human fetus is not a person with rights. But my opponent admitted that it is. Let me put this last argument from skepticism in a purely logical form. Let's assume not a dogmatic skepticism, which is self-contradictory, but a skeptical skepticism. Let's be skeptical even about skepticism. Let's assume that we don't know whether a fetus is a person or not. We don't know whether we can know that or not. What then can we know? Well, by formal logic alone, we can know two things. First, we know that either the fetus is or it is not a human person with a right to life, just as we know that either, either it's a Martian or not. It's either hairless or not, and so on. Uh, we may not know which it is, but we know that everything must be either X or non-X. And the second thing that we know is that either we do or do not know what it is. So there are only four possibilities. Either the fetus is or is not a human person, and either the person who justifies abortion knows or does not know what the fetus is. So the four logical possibilities are that the fetus is a human person and we know it, that it is a human person and we don't know it, that it's not a human person and we don't know it, and that it's not a human person and we do know that fact. Now, what is abortion in each case? In case number one, where the fetus is a human person and you know that, abortion is murder. It is the deliberate killing of what you know to be an innocent human person. That's a simple and strong and massive argument. No amount of pro-choice protest about how the word murder hurts them and imperils civil discussion can change the fact. In case number two, where the fetus is a human person, but you don't know that, abortion is manslaughter. It is like driving over an overcoat in the street at night that's shaped like a man, and you don't know whether there's a man under it or not. It's like shooting into a bush that may contain a deer or your fellow hunter. It's like fumigating a building with toxic chemicals without being certain that the building is fully evacuated. You don't know there's a person there, but you don't know that there isn't. And it just so happens there is a person there, and you kill that person. You can't plead ignorance. True, you didn't know there was a person there, so you didn't intend deliberate murder. But you didn't know there wasn't either, so your act was literally the height of irresponsibility. In case number three, where the fetus is not a person, but you don't know that, abortion is just as irresponsible as in case number two. 
you deliberately ran over the overcoat, shot into the bush, or fumigated the building without knowing that there were no persons there. You were lucky. There weren't. But you didn't know that, and you didn't care. You're just as irresponsible. You can't legally be charged with murder or even with manslaughter because no man was slaughtered. But you can and should be charged with criminal negligence. Only in case number four, where the fetus is not a person and you know that, is abortion morally reasonable, responsible, and permissible. But note carefully that what makes case number four permissible is not merely the fact that the fetus is not a person with full human rights, but also your knowledge of that fact, your overcoming of skepticism. So skepticism cannot count for abortion, but only against it. Only if you are not a skeptic can abortion be moral. Only if you are certain that there's no person in the overcoat or the bush or the building or the womb may you morally drive or shoot or fumigate or abort. So I think that undercuts even the weakest escape, namely to pretend you don't know what abortion is, you don't know what a fetus is, you don't know what a human being is. I have nothing to add to the argument at this point. Can I take uh, 30 seconds more later to answer the detailed uh, arguments of my opponent instead of taking all 15 minutes now? Yes. Okay. Sure. Okay. Yes, we'll do it that way. Five minutes. Five minutes affirmative rebuttal. Okay. Uh, well, there was a lot there. Let me uh, let me try to get to at least a couple of points. So. Um, First of all, yeah, I, let me try to clarify the respect in which I disagree with the three-premise argument that was provided. So uh, there was the scientific premise, human life begins at conception, all life, right? Uh, the moral premise, all humans have a right to life, and then the legal premise about the law protecting basic human rights. Um, so what's my disagreement? Well, my disagreement is with the claim that the pro-life conclusion follows from those premises. The, the conclusion doesn't follow from those premises. Um, what follows from those premises is that abortion involves killing someone who has a right to life, okay? But that doesn't show abortion is impermissible unless you add a further premise, okay? The further premise is that killing someone with a right to life is always impermissible, okay? That's the claim that I think is undermined by the case that I described earlier. So let me change the case further to make it a little bit more apparent than I did at first. So um, suppose that while Chad was asleep, uh, someone on my behalf hooked him up to the bone marrow extraction process. And so when he wakes up, he discovers right that bone marrow is being provided from his body to my body. Okay, And what he discovers is if he unplugs himself from this process because he doesn't want his body to be used to keep me alive, that's going to kill me. Okay, That's a case in which Chad is killing me. I do have a right to life. Okay, But there's something very idiosyncratic about the way he's killing me. He's killing me by depriving me of life support that I do not have the right to in the first place, Okay, at least according to all of you, or virtually all of you, uh, at, at the outset of my first uh, set of comments. Right. So the key claim behind this argument is, and let me just repeat this, the right to life is not the same thing as the right to be kept alive. The right to life is not the same thing as the right to life support. The right to life does not entail the right to life support. If it did, then because I have the right to life, I would have the right to his bone marrow. But virtually none of you thought that I had the right to his bone marrow. Okay? Um, prior to 1971, I think it's true that virtually everyone on both sides of the abortion debate agreed that if the fetus has a right to life, abortion was impermissible. In 1971, just a couple of years before Roe versus Wade, a uh, philosopher named Judith Jarvis Thompson at MIT published an influential article uh, with the same title as my book, A Defense of Abortion. And uh, I won't go into the details of the article, but I'm basically drawing on the insights of that article. So I think since that point, at least in the philosophical literature, uh, there's room for a very robust argument that says, look, we're just going to grant these claims here, but it doesn't follow uh, that abortion is impermissible. Okay. Um, let me try to briefly say something about a few of the other points that were raised. Uh, with respect to the claim that an argument in defense of abortion entails an argument in defense of infanticide, um, again, some arguments in defense of abortion do. This, this clearly doesn't, I think. Okay. Um, if it turns out that I'm healthy, right, Chad has no right to kill me, right? Once the baby's born and the woman, the baby doesn't need the woman's body to go on living, the woman doesn't have a right to kill it. So this particular argument in defense of abortion uh, doesn't have any implications, I think, about uh, cloning or genetic engineering or infanticide. Uh, the argument from skepticism, um, raise your hand if you feel absolutely certain that a cow does not have a right to life. 
You sure? Okay, so a few people seem to be sure. Most people, I think, um, are a little more uh, skeptical about this sort of thing. Okay, so um, I'll just leave it as something to think about. Um, the argument from skepticism would seem at least as strong as an argument for the claim that eating meat is wrong and think that it's much easier to not eat meat than it is to carry an unwanted pregnancy to term. So um, maybe during discussion we can come back to that. Um, then two uh, final points. I think I've got another I have a minute left. Yeah, okay, two final points. Um, with respect to the individualism versus communitarianism issue, um, ironically enough, my interpretation of Hobbes was somewhat communitarian, but that was a long time ago. Um, I'm actually in agreement with the claim that there's a certain sort of individualism that underlies my argument. Um, I don't think that's a problem, though, because I think what I would say is this. Um, if you incline toward a certain sort of communitarianism, uh, then you're going to say something like, hey, look, <laughs> Chad, right? I need that bone marrow. We're part of the same community. Come on, give it up, right? And so on a certain kind of community and political philosophy, uh, we would basically each have the right to each other's bodies when necessary. And on that sort of communitarian account, I do then agree that this particular argument in defense of abortion would not, would not succeed. Um, I was trying to argue from an assumption that it looked like virtually all of you accept. It looks like virtually all of you accept that uh, I don't have the right to Chad's uh, bone marrow. Um, okay, and then Am I out of time now? Or? You're, you're okay, I'm out of time. Thanks. Do you want to take your extra time now? Uh, we'll play it by ear. I might not. Okay, a negative rebuttal of five minutes, and perhaps this will be the time when he takes a couple of extra minutes. We're not sure. Okay. <laughs> Two things strike me. One is not surprising the other is the thing that's surprising is that uh, my opponent admits my three premises and admits that abortion is killing someone with a right to life and yet seems to say that sometimes it's not wrong to deprive someone of an inherent and fundamental right uh, if that person is innocent uh, the other thing that didn't surprise me, but strikes me, is how all of his cases, all of his parallels, all of his arguments from analogy, I think unlike mine, with the overcoat and the shooting in the bush and so on, are not natural but unnatural. The thing that struck me when I first read Judith Jarvis Thompson's famous article, The Defense of Abortion, which is very similar to his bone marrow case, in this case, it's a violinist whose life depends on the woman being hooked up to a continuous blood transfusion in the hospital, uh, is how utterly unnatural it is, how it isn't parallel. It's an argument from analogy, and the analogy doesn't work. Uh, to use the famous feminist uh, argument, it's like comparing a fish and a bicycle. Uh, You ask the question, when does the fetus have a right to use the woman's body? What, what a strange way to describe pregnancy. One person using another's body. If that is what pregnancy is, then every pregnancy violates the categorical imperative. Because we should not use other persons. Uh, I also don't see how you get away with not defending infanticide, because nursing is also necessary for life. The only difference is that you can have somebody else do the nursing, but somebody has to nurse that baby. That baby, even when it's born, is dependent upon some mothers, some women, uh, otherwise it will die. Although I don't want to press that too much because I remember an argument that I once lost with some very intelligent feminists. I argued that there was no argument that justified abortion that didn't also justify infanticide. And they concluded, you convinced us, you persuaded us, we didn't think we could change our minds, but we have. I said, oh, you're pro-life now? No. They said, we're pro-infanticide. The compensation uh, element here, I agree that in the case of rape, there needs to be compensation. And since the rapist can't make it, society must make it somehow. Uh, but in the case of a pregnancy that's not due to rape, uh, it seems to be, a, a, again, an unnatural parallel because the fetus is not guilty like, like a rapist. The fetus is not a willing perpetrator of harm against the woman. 
And to compare this with, with walking in the park where you don't want to be mugged, but you know you might be, is like comparing a man that a woman supposedly loves with a mugger. Uh, that's very strange. Throughout the argument, pregnancy is treated as something like mugging or something like kidnapping or uh, something like a, a disease. But suppose, suppose we treat pregnancy as most societies throughout the history of the world and all cultures have treated it, namely as something that's more like a, a, a power, a privilege. Suppose that is its nature, whatever our attitude towards it is. Uh, if, if I kiss you, or if I give you a, a gift, or if I give you a compliment, you can indeed be hurt by that, but you shouldn't, because it's a gift, it's not a threat. On the other hand, if I slap you in the face, you could thank me for it, if you're something of a masochist, but by its nature, it's, it's meant to harm. I'll stop there and just wait to see what uh, is done with these strange analogies. <laughs> okay, a second affirmative rebuttal of five minutes. I was just wondering about that myself. Um, uh, yeah, let me try to make a couple of quick points first and then I'll try to be a little slower on a couple of others. Um, first quick point, I just want to clarify, um, with respect to the three premise argument, um, I'm, I'm assuming for the sake of the argument that those three premises are correct. I don't think I have time in one evening to go through all of them. So uh, the point was the argument I presented during my opening statement, the way it relates to the three premise argument is that argument suggests that even if the premises are true, the conclusion doesn't follow. Um, I think there's pretty good room to question the second premise. Um, if you think that a human being in a permanent irreversible coma does not have a right to life, as I think many people do think, again, a permanent, irreversible coma, uh, then what you're going to think is mere species membership is not morally relevant. But I, I don't want to press that point here. I just want to clarify that I wasn't uh, conceding for sure that the second premise was true, just conceding it for the sake of the argument. Okay. Um, then let me say a little bit about this natural versus unnatural business. Um, here's what is true. Um, I presented a series of examples, most of which in one degree or another were artificial rather than natural. Okay. So my question is, why should that matter? Okay. Um, it can matter depending on the purposes that the examples are used for. Right? In my case, the examples were used to motivate a general moral principle. The general moral principle still seems to be correct. In particular, having a right to life is not the same as having a right to be kept alive by someone else. Having a right to life does not entail having the right to be kept alive by someone else. As long as you accept those claims, the fact that they arose from an artificial rather than a natural example uh, strikes me as not morally relevant. Somewhat more specifically, um, here's a kind of objection that potentially, I think, is a reasonable objection to arguments based on hypothetical artificial cases. Sometimes artificial cases are such that our intuitions are unclear. The case is so artificial, so science fiction-ish, uh, time travel, et cetera, et cetera, that we're not really sure how we respond. Um, my experience has been that that's not the case with these sorts of examples. Even though it's a very fanciful situation where Chad wakes up and discovers that he's been plugged into a machine that's pumping his blood marrow into my body, almost all of us still have a very strong, clear, intuitive reaction. Chad has the right to unplug himself. He has the right to discontinue providing life support to me despite the fact that that will bring about my death. Even though I'm a person and I have a right to life, it does not follow that I have the right to be kept alive by him. Um, I'll make one other quick comment about that and then try to get to a few of these other points. Uh, the other quick comment is a little bit less defensive and a little bit more constructive. Um, I think, in fact, there's a very good reason to argue from artificial cases rather than natural cases. Natural cases tend to elicit in most of us emotional responses of a certain sort. Okay? For some, the emotional response might be one of valuing the pregnancy, wanting the pregnancy to continue. For others, it might be an emotional response of uh, caring about women not being oppressed and thinking reproductive freedom is important to avoid oppression and so forth. So I think it's actually better from a philosophical point of view to set those cases aside and focus on abstract cases where most of us can be more dispassionate and objective. And if in those cases we find, look, 
it just seems clear a right to life does not mean a right to be kept alive, then what we ought to do is take that lesson that we've learned in the clear, dispassionate, objective cases, and then apply that lesson to the case where many of us on both sides of the issue, I think, are inclined to let our emotions get involved. Um, and then just, do I have another minute? Or? Yeah. Uh, let me try to address uh, the concern about infanticide again. Um, so the point is basically this. When the fetus is in the woman's body, the fetus needs that woman's body to go on living. If the woman doesn't want to provide that life support, just like if Chad doesn't want to provide the life support to me, the argument maintains she has the right to discontinue providing it. Okay? Prior to viability, inevitably, that means the fetus dies. Okay? Once the baby is born, yes, she has the right not to nurse the baby if she wants to. I doubt anybody would deny that because virtually everybody agrees that adoption is morally permissible. So if she wants, she can put the baby up for adoption. The argument that I presented in no way implies that at that point she can kill the baby because at that point the baby is not making any demands on her. When the baby is making unwanted demands on her body, my argument maintains she has the right to decline to provide that assistance. Once the baby has been born, the baby is not making any unwanted demands on her body, and if she doesn't want to keep it alive, she has no uh, right to prevent someone else from keeping it alive. So I do agree that some arguments in defense of abortion can tend to blur into arguments in defense of infanticide. Uh, I'm familiar with some of those arguments, but um, I feel quite emphatically that this is not one of those arguments. A second negative rebuttal, five minutes. I'm glad I saved some time because this is, I think, when I will take it because we're into deep philosophical principles here. We're not just arguing about rules and cases. Uh, two things. First, a very specific logical question, which can be answered very quickly. Uh, when is it right to kill a baby? Uh, you admit that once the baby's born, its right to life trumps even the mother's convenience. She can put it up for adoption. You don't justify infanticide. All right. Uh, if infanticide is wrong and abortion is not, then at what point does killing the baby become wrong? When the umbilical cord is cut so that it's the doctor's scissors that gives the baby the right to live? Or is it more and more wrong to kill a baby as the pregnancy wears on? Not because the baby is bigger or approximates what we are more, but because the baby is getting closer and closer to independence. But that too is a, a, a matter of degree. How can, whether it's right to kill a person with a right to life or not, depend upon something that's a matter of degree? That's my first question. But my deeper question uh, involves some deeper philosophical principles here. And I think I now understand what divides us on foundational grounds. Uh, my fundamental challenge was these examples of yours are all unnatural. And your fundamental answer was, OK, that's not so bad, because I wasn't arguing by a kind of a direct analogy. I was arguing in order to prove a general principle. So however artificial these examples are, if your agreement with these examples logically entails your agreement with a general principle, and then if in turn that general principle can be used to justify abortion, then logically you have granted the right to abortion. I think you're confusing induction with abstraction here. I think these unnatural examples do not convince us of the general principle, and that my natural examples do, because the natural examples can be understood to be relevant, whereas the unnatural examples can't. The difference between induction and abstraction is that induction is a purely logical procedure, which a computer can do, whereas abstraction is a specifically human act of understanding. You can abstract human nature from human beings, or the nature of grapefruits from grapefruits, or the nature of triangles from different kinds of triangles, but that's an immediate first act of the mind act, uh, which computers can't do. A second connected difference is, I think, the relation between reason and emotion. 
These natural cases do elicit from us an immediate instinctive emotional response, which the artificial ones don't. And therefore, the artificial ones are better from your point of view. I think they're worse from my point of view. I don't see emotions as irrational. I find emotions revelatory. We have emotions about things. To use an example I gave a moment ago, if you slap me in the face and I smile and say thank you, that's an emotion, but it's revelatory of something. It's revelatory that I'm a masochist. Uh, I don't see emotions as being the enemies of reason. Uh, unless emotion and reason function together, Nietzsche showed this very powerfully, you don't have great art. Uh, you don't have love. You don't have religion. In all the most important human areas, we don't separate these two things. There are times when we do want to separate them, especially in science. If the laboratory worker is in love with his guinea pigs, he's not going to cut them up. <laughs> but I don't think we should treat women as guinea pigs and cut up their emotion, our emotional response versus our uh, rational response in, in that way. We can distinguish them. But I think we have to bring in our emotional response as very important and relevant data. Uh, and therefore, I would not want to do ethics in a purely deductive way or a purely inductive way. Let me give you an example of that. A uh, ethical dilemma that students always ask about is lying, because the ethics of lying, I think, is, is a little more tricky than the ethics of, of most commandments. Uh, most of us think that lying is bad, inherently. Uh, Kant wrote his great classic, Metaphysic of Morals, uh, precisely to, uh, to deal with the question of, is it ever right to lie? And he argued that it isn't, because of his categorical imperative. And the classic case is, if you're a Dutchman hiding Jews from the Nazis, do you lie to them when they, they come to your door? Now, the two classical answers to that are yes and no. But if you say yes, that means lying isn't always wrong. If you say no, you say it's because lying is always wrong. I don't start there. I start with saying, obviously, we all know that it's not right to tell them. We don't know why. We don't know whether it's an inductive or a deductive argument. But obviously, you don't tell the Nazis. You deceive them. You deliberately deceive them. Now, do you do that because sometimes it's right to lie? Or do you do that because this is not a lie? Or do you do that because they've given up their right to the truth? I don't much care. <laughs> I just know that you don't do that. And I think we instinctively know the same thing about abortion, that it's wrong for a, a mother to kill her baby. All right. Um, an affirmative question for the opponent. Yeah, I guess um, I'll ask a question about the role that naturalness plays in the position that's being taken. And um, the way I'll put the question is this. Th th here's a partial list of things that at least some uh, biologists have argued uh, are natural. Uh, racism, envy, male sexual promiscuity, rape. Um, these are all clearly cases of something that we would think, even if they're natural, there's no particular reason to think that they're morally acceptable. So I guess my basic question is, um, what is the relation between something's being natural and it's being morally either uh, permissible or uh, good? Okay, I'm glad negative, you, excuse me, negative response to the affirmative question, five minutes. I'm glad you asked that question because that reveals, I think, uh, maybe more clear than anything I said a moment ago, uh, the deeper philosophical divide between us. There's two things you might mean by natural. You might mean something that is empirically or statistically ordinary or normal. Or you might mean something teleological, something that inherently helps rather than harms or conduces to the perfecting or the flourishing or the happiness of the thing you're talking about. And I think you mean the first thing by natural, and I mean the second thing by natural. Uh, you say then that rape 
and promiscuity are natural because they're ordinary, they occur. I would say they're both unnatural. I don't think we do, in fact, and we certainly ought not to judge whether a thing is morally right or not by a purely empirical test. That's confusing facts with values. If all the men in the world uh, were much more strongly inclined to rape women than they are, and if they all did it all the time, and if they all justified it, that would not make it one bit more right because it harms the very nature of a woman, part of which is her free consent. So my notion of natural is a very old fashioned one. It's a basically Aristotelian, teleological, uh, commonsensical notion of natural. Uh, I think the deeper divide between us then is that I'm pre-Cartesian and you're post-Cartesian. You're thinking either in a purely logical, deductive way or in a purely empirical way. And I'm trying to transcend that divide by looking at the, uh, the naturalness of, of the act. You now have a chance, uh, a negative question for the opponent. Okay, I would say, when do you think it is morally okay to kill your baby? And why do you draw the line where you do? Affirmative response to the negative question, five minutes. Uh, good. So um, I think here maybe it's easiest to answer the question by going back to the article I referred to earlier by Judith Thompson. So um, sorry for the artificial example. Uh, her case involved one where you wake up in the hospital and discover that you've been plugged in through, again, a sort of medical device to this unconscious violinist. And again, if you stay plugged in for nine months, the violinist will go on living. And if not, he'll, he'll die. Um, so here's what Thompson said in a quite neglected passage in that article. And then I'll use this to answer the question. Uh, she said, surely, and I would assume since you agreed in my Chad case, you'll agree here too. Uh, if you found yourself in this situation, you would have the right to unplug yourself from the violinist. Suppose, upon unplugging yourself from the violinist, miraculously he survived. Would you have the right to slit his throat? Of course not, she said. Okay. What's the significance of this in the context of the question? Well, it's this. Once again, the argument in defense of abortion rests on the claim that the right to life does not entail the right to life support. In certain idiosyncratic circumstances, a death is brought about by depriving someone of life support that they do not have the right to. In those cases, a death is brought about to someone who has a right to life in a manner that does not violate their right to life. Okay? If the person is no longer in a situation in which they need the use of another person's body to go on living, then at that point, the argument becomes silent. It does not say, go ahead and kill the person, because now, if you were to kill them, you would not be killing them by withdrawing life support. You'd be killing them by slitting their throat or burning them or shooting them or what have you. Okay. In the context of the abortion case, I think the implication is quite clear, although Thompson herself, I don't think, drew it out as clearly as she could. So the answer is simply this, viability. Okay? Once a fetus is capable of living on its own, the woman may have the right to have it removed. She doesn't have to provide it life support. Someone else can provide it life support. Just as once she gives birth to it, if she doesn't want to nurse it, someone else can take care of it. Okay? So the answer to the question is, right? The line between the viable fetus and the pre-viable fetus is morally relevant, not because the fetus suddenly acquires a right to life at viability. That, I agree, would be a puzzling result. I'm assuming for the sake of the argument the fetus has the right to life all the way through. Okay? Rather, what's morally significant about viability is that at viability it's no longer the case right, that the fetus will die if the woman declines to provide it life support. Okay. So um, do I have a minute left or am I... Yes, you do. Okay, so, um, okay, at the risk of repetition, let me just try to summarize. Um, many people on both sides of the abortion debate have a feeling that there's something about viability. Many defenders of abortion are very uncomfortable defending abortion after viability. Even opponents of abortion who oppose it all the way through seem to think there's something especially objectionable about late-term abortions after viability. Um, if someone's trying to account for that by saying the fetus acquires some new moral standing at viability, again, I agree that would be a peculiar position to take. But the argument I've been presenting tonight doesn't require that. And in fact, part of what I think is quite promising about this argument is it explains this result without having to make that somewhat puzzling claim. Okay? 
The fetus all the way through does have the right to life. All the way through, that does not mean that the woman has to provide life support to it. When the fetus is not yet viable, when the woman declines to provide life support, the fetus will die. Once the fetus is viable, the woman can have the fetus removed or she can give birth to the fetus. Either way, she can walk away. But there's nothing about the argument, again, the argument that says she has the right to withhold life support, that says she also has the right to kill. In the same way, if I may just conclude, that there was nothing about my claim about Chad having the right to withhold his bone marrow from me that implied that he had the right to shoot me in the head. All right, we're down to the final uh, exchange. A negative closing of five minutes. Okay. I compliment my opponent for the logic of his arguments and the clarity of his arguments. And rather than try to give a purely logical response, uh, I would conclude with two things, one a question and one a confession. The question is, do you really think that your arguments would significantly help a woman to overcome the guilt that she usually feels after she has an abortion? If not, is this simply because she's emotional rather than rational? And the confession is uh, why I'm pro-life. That is a motive rather than a reason. I think motives are things that move us often more than reasons. Uh, there's two reasons that I'm pro-life. One is because I want to be ethical. And the other is because I want to be religious. And the two come together. Uh, it seems to me abortion is simply unjust, unethical, unfair. It seems to me that it is not a complex issue at all. If it's not wrong for big, strong people to kill little, weak people just because they don't want them to live, then what could possibly be wrong? What could the word wrong possibly mean then? Only perhaps that the only thing that's wrong is using the word wrong. If there's any one moral rule that any morally sane person must admit, it's this one. Love people, all people, respect people, treat people as ends, not means. Don't use them. Persons are ends, not means. Killing them certainly does not treat them as ends. It treats them as cockroaches. It's not amazing that many of the same people who deplore capital punishment against convicted murderers uh, promote capital punishment against innocent babies. I meant to say that is amazing. Uh, apparently in this ethical system, the crime of a baby being in a mother's way is deserving of death, but the crime of getting another adult out of your way by killing him is not. And secondly, I will confess that abortion is indeed, for most pro-lifers, a religious issue, but not in the way that our critics say. It's not just a Catholic issue or just a Christian issue. It's a war between all religions and none. Because all the religions of the world, organized or disorganized, and I never met an organized religion in my life. They all strike me as rather like Noah's Ark. <laughs> all the religions of the world see human life as a sacred mystery. Opposition to abortion then is instinctively religious, but not sectarian. The idea that life is sacred is by definition a religious idea, but it doesn't belong to any one religion. It belongs to the human race. And its enemy is that tiny, powerful army of the arrogant who scorn the deepest convictions of 99 out of every 100 humans who have ever walked the earth as some old, silly, superstitious fallacy or fantasy or folly or fear. And if from our consciousness is abolished the very sense of the sacred, then from our consciousness can easily be abolished the sense of the sacredness of lives. And once the sense of the sacredness of lives can be abolished, those lives can be abolished. So the fight for the sanctity of life is literally a holy war. It's a war for holiness itself. Here is my most non-negotiable reason for fighting for the pro-life cause and the reason why pro-lifers will never, never, never give up, why we can never give up, why we have no choice. We are not pro-choice. Here we stand. We cannot do otherwise. God help us. It's because the face that confronts us in some way, however inchoate and unconscious, is not just the tiny innocent face of the human baby or the face of the woman, but the enormous, totally innocent face of God who has designed and created us and the woman and the baby 
It is that image that abortion kills. Abortion is homicide, and homicide is deicide because man is God's image, God's child. Abortion's victim is one of God's kids, and if you kill any good father's kids, you're far more his enemy than if you kill him. Do you think God is any less loyal to his kids than we are? People often ask where God was in the Holocaust. My answer is that he was gassed. We all know that we will die, and we all instinctively know that when we die, we will stop avoiding truth because we will find truth unavoidable. And if we believe in God, we know why. We will stand before the truth. And the truth will say to us something like this, I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. I was in the womb, the place of holy life, and you slaughtered me. And we will ask, Lord, when did we do this? And he will answer, truly, truly, I tell you, whenever you did this to one of the least of my brethren, you did it to me. And finally, an affirmative closing of five minutes. Okay, sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be indirect here again for a minute. Um, here's, the reason, here's the three reasons someone might give you for being a vegetarian. They might say it's self-evident, eating meat is wrong. They might have a very powerful emotional reaction to the suffering of animals. They might have a religious belief to the effect that animals were not created to be eaten by us. If you were exposed to any or all three of these reasons for being a vegetarian, you might find them compelling, but you might not. Uh, but there's a fourth sort of reason you might be given, and the fourth sort of reason would be this. There is an argument. It starts from premises that virtually all carnivores accept, and it shows that eating meat is wrong. Okay? If you are a carnivore, I think you should be worried about the fourth kind of argument. I don't think you necessarily have to be worried about the first three. Now, with respect to abortion, I at least am inclined to say the same thing. You may find that it's self-evident that abortion is wrong. Here's an example of a self-evident statement. If A is greater than B and B is greater than C, then A is greater than C. Okay? Maybe the wrongness of abortion seems as obvious to you as that seems to me. It seems as obvious to you that it's permissible to require a woman to undergo the burden of an unwanted pregnancy. Um, if you find it self-evident, I don't really think there's a need for debate. I don't think there's a purpose for debate. Um, if your reason for opposing abortion is emotional, you feel a certain sort of love that leads you to that conclusion. As with the case of the person who loves animals and thinks they shouldn't be eaten, um, I don't particularly think a debate is going to change your mind. Um, and certainly the same would be true of an argument based on either a particular religion or religion in general. If you have a theistic belief of some sort, and that belief entails the rawness of abortion, I don't really think there's a room for argument unless the argument takes place within that particular theistic context. It seems doubtful to me, uh, just referring briefly to the topic of tonight's debate, whether abortion is justifiable in a free society, that a free society would want to resolve that question based on uh, theistic principles. Uh, but here's a final sort of reason that might be given. There's an argument. The argument starts from premises that most people on both sides of the abortion debate accept, and it shows that abortion is wrong. In the philosophical literature, there are many very powerful arguments of this sort. When I first started working on my book on abortion, I was teaching a course uh, at Tulane, actually, on the ethics of abortion, and we ran through all the arguments. And on the last day of the semester, two students came up to me, and they said that they had had a running bet going on during the semester. Uh, you might find this a bit hard to believe now. Uh, one of them was sure I was pro-choice, and the other was sure I was pro-life. And I said, well, you know, to the student who thought I was pro-life, well, why did you think that? And she said, well, when you presented those pro-life arguments, you presented them in a manner that made them seem incredibly powerful. And I said, I think there are a number of incredibly powerful arguments that attempt to show that abortion is wrong and start simply from assumptions that most people on both sides of the abortion debate accept. What I've tried to do this evening is explain why, in the end, I think that those arguments fail. I think they fail because they leave open a space, and I admit, it's a logical space, so the argument I'm giving is logical. Um, I guess as a philosopher, I'm not used to being called logical in sort of an accusatory sense. Uh, but uh, the fact remains, 
at least according to the position that I've defended, that securing the claim that the fetus has a right to life is not sufficient to justify the claim that abortion is impermissible. Um, let me just make one final comment. Um, this is something maybe I should have clarified at the beginning, although I hope at least it was sort of implicit in what I said. Um, I've defended a fairly narrow claim, and the fairly narrow claim is a claim about rights. Strictly speaking, a woman is morally within her rights if she chooses not to carry the pregnancy to term. That's what I said about Chad. He's within his rights if he decides he doesn't want to keep me alive. Okay? I have not said, nor do I want to say, that declining to keep the fetus alive is the right choice. Nor have I said that it's a good choice or a praiseworthy choice or the best choice. There can be a variety of reasons for thinking it's not the best choice, and thus a variety of reasons for trying to convince a woman not to make that choice. In that sense, maybe I'll just conclude by saying, um, I, back at Yale for the first time in 10 years, um, I'm happy to see that there's an organization at Yale uh, called Choose Life at Yale, and nothing that I've said this evening I think is inconsistent with the claim that the right choice for a woman to make in many circumstances is to choose not to have an abortion. Okay, But the key word is choice. Hearty thank you to both of our speakers. Uh, we now have uh, the final um, section, and that involves questions from the audience. So I will uh, ask um, people to raise their hand, and I'll try to call on as many of you as I can. I'm sorry, I couldn't see where you were. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, the idea that, that abortion is equivalent to cutting life support I find problematic because in the real world, abortion is not simply the mother, mother cutting the umbilical cord. It is a doctor actively, violently destroying the fetus. So that, the, the parallel doesn't work. On, on, a, on another, um, my main question is, it goes to the um, the idea, you, you said that you know a woman who decides not to feed her child um, and can give it up to adoption. You're basing that on certain empirical reality that there are people out there who are willing to take care of children. But using your own sort of strict logic, in the parallel with Chad, what if a um, particular child is born, the mother doesn't want to feed the baby, but actually there is no other woman who wants to take care of the baby. Um, does the mother have the right not to feed the child? Right. Okay, no, those are two very good questions. Um, I realize you were maybe more concerned with the second, but let me say something about both of them. Um, with respect to the first question, yeah, um, there are a variety of abortion procedures. Most of the most common do involve, I think you're right, uh, actively killing the fetus either prior to removing it or in the process of removing it. Um, there are, however, a couple of procedures, and I'm not going to go into any detail, uh, that basically involve removing the fetus intact. And so I'll just mention very quickly one hysterotomy um, basically amounts to performing a cesarean section on a pre-viable fetus. And so in that instance, the fetus is removed intact because it's pre-viable, it's not going to survive. And then typically, at least as I understand it, uh, it is left to die. So um, I'll just say this quickly, and then I want to get to your second question. Um, if a critic of my argument says, you know, your argument would work if only abortion did involve letting die rather than killing, um, then what they would have to concede is that abortion by that method is permissible, but abortion by other methods is not permissible. Um, some people might hold that view, but my impression is, and over the last several years I've spent a lot of time talking with a lot of people on both sides of the issue, uh, virtually nobody holds that view. And so um, if you think abortion is wrong, even if it involves removing the pre-viable fetus and then allowing it to die, um, then that, that, that seems to me that can't be the problem with, with the argument. Um, as far as the infanticide case goes, uh, yeah, that's a really good question. So let me say this. Um, woman gives birth to a baby. There's no one around to take care of it. Does she have an obligation to take care of it? Yes. Okay. However, that's not because she created the baby. Okay. Suppose you come across a baby in a dumpster. There's no one else around to take care of it. Do you have an obligation to take care of it? Yes. Did you cause that baby to exist? No. Okay, so um, in those sorts of circumstances, when a woman finds herself with a baby that only she can take care of, okay, if the care that she can provide 
is of this relatively trivial demand. Again, breastfeeding is not a significant harm, whereas having bone marrow extracted is significant, going through nine months of unwanted pregnancy is significant. Uh, then I think she has an obligation to care for the baby, regardless of whether it's her baby. Um, so again, I don't actually think it's a problem for my argument. Thank you. Uh, this is for uh, Professor Kruger. Uh I, I want to uh, ask about your characterization of the first premise in your argument. You called it a scientific premise, but I think it's really a metaphysical premise because uh, what science does is it's going to predict how organisms are going to respond to various stimuli, how they relate to things. Whether a concept like personhood or life or humanity applies to a particular entity, that's, that's a metaphysical question. And so what I'm wondering is, do you think there's a meaningful distinction between terminating a pregnancy in a blastocyst stage versus a uh, viable, conscious, fetal stage that hasn't been born yet? Um, and if you don't, um, there, I mean, there are religions that think that uh, ensoulment happens sometime after conception. Um, is there a non-religious reason to think that, that the con all these concepts apply at the moment of conception? Yes, yeah, so I was contrasting science more to religion than to metaphysics. Uh, uh, the standard notion of science among most scientists today is non-metaphysical. It simply predicts and controls. I was using the older notion of science, uh, which has some metaphysical standing, not in the sense of metaphysics that you find in Southern California bookstores, that's the occult, but uh, uh, asking the question what a thing is. Uh, I don't th think you can do ethics without metaphysics. Uh, the reason that you treat a person this way is because of what a person is. Now, many pro-choice philosophers will make a sharp distinction between the word human being and the word person. And I think there is a, a distinction, but it's not a sharp distinction. If there are Martians, they're persons. Uh, they're not members of the human race, but they are capable of making rational and moral choices. They're, they're aware of good and evil, and they're free to choose between them. That constitutes them as persons. The Greek gods were persons, fictional persons. Uh, if you believe in angels, angels are persons without human bodies. So my claim is not strictly biological. I would take the fact that the, the fetus from the moment of conception is fully human. That is, it has the genetic code and is growing in a totally human way and it's growing a human brain and nervous system and it will be able to perform human acts and nothing but a human being can do that. I would, I would take that indeed as a scientific indication that you have a metaphysical reality there, which is a member of a race which produces persons and not just animals, which is why I would say uh, I am quite confident that animals do not have a right to life, and I don't feel guilty about uh, uh, eating McDonald's hamburgers, although I do feel guilty about cruelty to animals because they have pain. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, this is for Professor Boone. Um, I, I just wanted to go off of her question a little bit and try to connect it uh, yeah. with the, the causal circumstances that um, Professor Boone talked about at the as one of the three sort of mitigating circumstances. Okay. Um, so, so let's take first of all child neglect laws, um, and I wonder what. Uh, how those fit um, into the professor's schema here. And then the other thing would be, uh, if I make someone dependent on me, um, if we draw up some bizarre contract or whatever, um, and I lock them in a house, and I'm the only one that can feed them, but I don't have much money, and so it's actually quite a big deal and uh, non-trivial for me to continue bringing them food. Do I nonetheless have an obligation uh, to, or do I have a right to stop bringing them food and just let them die? Good. Um, let me start with the second question, then I, I may have to ask for a little clarification about the first question. Okay, so I do an act that causes someone to be dependent on me. Do I then have to provide them life support? Um, so here's an example where I do an act and it causes someone to be dependent on me, okay? Um, there is someone who has an illness and I can save their life by performing a procedure but what I know is that if I perform the procedure, a certain number of years later, they're going to need a new kidney, okay? Um, if I don't perform the procedure, they die now, okay? They won't need my kidney. If I do perform the procedure, I've caused them to need my kidney later on, right? 
Okay? They wouldn't need my kidney if I hadn't done the procedure. In that case, I think, we're all going to have the intuition, I'm not obligated to give this person my kidney just because I saved their life before. Right? So the answer to your question is this. In some cases, when you cause someone to be needy, you don't have an obligation to help them later on. Those are cases in which you cause neediness but not harm them. Okay? If you cause someone to be needy but not worse off than they would otherwise have been, then no, you don't owe them compensation. In the sort of case you described, at least as I understood it, if I don't lock this person up in the house, they're going to be much better off. When I lock them up in the house, I make them worse off than they would otherwise have been. So yes, in that situation, I then have an obligation, I think, to restore them to the level of well-being that they were at before, even if it's a pretty substantial burden for me to do so. Um, and that's why, again, the key question in the abortion context is, when a woman conceives, is the act of conceiving the fetus an act that makes the fetus worse off than it would otherwise have been? If it is, then I agree the argument would suggest that uh, she would owe compensation to the fetus. But that claim seems to me uh, quite implausible. Um, one last quick wrinkle, and then I, I may need a refresher on the first part of your question. Um, here's a further implication that critics of abortion, I think, should be quite concerned about if they try to respond to this argument in this way. Um, suppose a woman is told that she's quite prone to miscarriage. Okay? The doctor says, if you want to have a child, I can tell you, with virtual certainty, you're going to have three or four miscarriages before you uh, have a live birth. Okay? Um, if it's the case right, that conceiving a fetus and then ha not having it come to term uh, is a substantial harm to that fetus, then in effect what this woman is being told right, is um, the only way you can have a child is by committing negligent homicide three or four times. Okay? Uh, the critic of abortion should then, I think, have to say it's morally impermissible for women to have intercourse if they're prone to miscarriage. Um, but very few critics of abortion that I'm aware of uh, are willing to say that. Uh, and then I'm sorry, so the first part of your question was about child neglect laws, is that right? Um, can you be maybe a little more specific? Sure. Uh, again, running with the, uh, there, there's a causal connection between, um, it, she more or less asked it, so maybe maybe just um, if, if uh, why do we have child neglect laws, given that uh, the child could be given up for adoption or whatever? And, and secondly, I guess going off of finding the baby in the, in the dumpster, there was a whole side of the room that was kind of confused as to why uh, you thought that um, the, we, we suddenly had this obligation to take care of the child in the dumpster, but the child within the woman's own body, she doesn't have, who, with whom she has some causal connection, uh, she doesn't have any obligation to continue to her. Okay. Right. Okay, so, um, yeah, no, I, I can see how my answer went by a bit quickly. Um, I guess I was presupposing something that I shouldn't have presupposed. Um, my presupposition was basically this. Um, when you find a child in the dumpster, here are some things you can do to save its life. Um, you can bring it to the fire department. You can bring it to the police department. Um, you can give it some food and then bring it to the hospital, something like that. Um, my assumption was that that was a case where someone can, uh, sorry, you can save someone's life at basically a sort of trivial cost to yourself. Um, if a woman is pregnant, and she can keep the fetus alive at a trivial cost to herself. So um, for some reason, it, it, you know, the pregnancy, it's as if she's not pregnant. She doesn't experience any symptoms and so forth. Uh, you know, th then I, I think things would be, would be somewhat different. Um, th that's what I had in mind by that. Um, as far as the child negligence laws, um, I guess maybe I'm still, uh, sorry if I'm being obscure here, I'm not quite sure I see the way that it directly interacts with, with the argument that I was raising. Um, child neglect laws concern relations between parents and children that they're responsible for, regardless of whether they're their biological offspring, right? My adopted child, my biological child, right? Once I take that child home from the hospital, I have certain obligations to that child, not because it is or isn't genetically related to me, but because I've made a decision not to put the child up for adoption. So I, I don't think that that directly bears, at least as far as I can see on my, on my argument. Okay. Uh, yes, way in the back. Two questions, the second of which is sort of two-part. First of all, I, I'm kind of confused about this thing that keeps getting repeated about the, the non-trivial cost of carrying a child. I mean, it's nine months. Like, it's not that big a deal. So I guess, like, uh, you know, in the grand scheme of a woman's life, um, sorry, yes, I, I would like to ask the... Uh, yeah, that was clear. Sorry, go ahead. Apologies. That's okay. Um, you know, in the grand scheme of a woman's life, you know, supposing her lifespan is, you know, in the modern times, 75 years to be on the low side, that's nine months. So, so I guess I'm just not sure what the standards are for trivial versus non-trivial. Right. But the, yeah. um, sorry. Can I try to answer that one first and then? Sure. You can, okay. So, um, yeah, look, I agree. Like a lot of loans in, in ethics, uh, there's not going to be a clear divide. Um, 
what I had in mind, I guess, was this. Um, it looked to me like virtually everyone in this room agreed that having bone marrow extracted from you was on the non-trivial side of the line. So I guess I would just ask this as a thought experiment, and maybe some of you who uh, are here who have been pregnant before, um, which would you find less burdensome, uh, going through the entire nine months of an unwanted pregnancy or having some bone marrow extracted? And so the assumption I was making, and it could be wrong for some people, but the assumption I was making was that the nine months of an unwanted pregnancy were at least as burdensome as the bone marrow extraction. Now, it is open to someone to respond upon reflection by saying, I'm so convinced that the woman would have an obligation to keep the fetus alive that now I think that basically Chad doesn't have a right to withhold his bone marrow from me. Um, and that would be a consistent position to hold. Um, so I, I think that that would be okay. Um, but again, I was trying to argue from assumptions that it looked like most people in the room were accepting. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, the, the second question was, so you seem to sort of start out with a thought experiment that said, well, you know, Chad wakes up, he's connected, you know, by a machine to you, who needs his bone marrow, and so, you know, we all sort of have the instinct that it would be okay for him to disconnect the machine. But I think that the more proper analogy is, Chad is connected to you by this machine. It cannot be disconnected, and the only way Chad can stop the sort of flow of bone marrow out of his body is by shooting you in the head, right? And if you present that analogy, I think, you know, I, I would imagine a number of people in the room who would think that that was okay would go down significantly. Yeah. So, so I guess I'm curious. I'm curious. You know, why the, your form of that analogy is, is more defensible than the latter form? And sure. the broader implication there is, you know, is it really possible? Sorry, I'm being alone no, with please. it. But the broader implication is, is it really possible to say you, you know, the, the right to life is not the same thing as the right to life support when you're talking about the kind of creature for whom those two are identical? Like a baby has no life without life support. Like it just doesn't. Uh, so, so does it really make sense to distinguish them? So right. Okay, good. Um, so let me say a couple of things. Um, maybe I'll, I'll start at the end there. Um, remember, in the case that I described, when I have the fatal disease, uh, there's no life for me without life support either. So um, if you think, if, if you think I do not have a right to Chad's bone marrow, okay, then you do think, and I hope you think I have a right to life, even if you disagree with me. <laughs> uh, if you, so maybe I should have made that explicit. If you agree I have a right to life and you agree that I don't have a right to Chad's bone marrow, then I think that's all I need for that. Okay, then um, again, let me try to be brief. Uh, two sorts of responses. Um, first, as I, as I said a few moments ago, uh, strictly speaking, it's not true that abortion necessarily is more like uh, Chad's shooting me in the head in the scenario I described. Uh, as I said, there are at least a few methods of abortion that do basically involve removing the fetus intact. It's still alive when it comes out. The woman just says, I choose not to provide uh, life support. Um, second, I think you had a very good question about modifying the case, but let me modify it one step further. Okay, um, Let's specify that the individual who needs Chad's bone marrow is unconscious. Okay, So if that's me, then obviously I'm not the one who plugged myself into Chad. Someone on my behalf, maybe a hired agent or an insurance company, they plugged me into Chad. Okay, Chad finds himself in the following situation. Either I'm stuck letting David use my bone marrow or I can't simply disconnect myself. I have to, again, poison him or what have you, uh, kill him so that I can then disconnect him. Okay, um, That is a challenging question. I'll make a brief suggestion. Okay. The brief suggestion is this. In general, killing is far worse than letting die. However, killing is far worse than letting die for a reason. The reason is killing involves causing someone to be worse off than they will otherwise be. Letting die involves really allowing someone to be worse off. Okay. In this particular case, if Chad kills me rather than simply letting me die, he doesn't make me worse off. He doesn't cause me to be worse off than I would otherwise be. Excuse me. Uh, he simply causes me to die one way rather than another. If I'm conscious, that might make a big difference to me. I'd rather die painlessly than painfully, for example. Uh, but if I'm unconscious, then I think that doesn't follow. So at least prior to consciousness, um, I guess my view is the argument would work even for cases of abortion that involve killing. Um, as I said, if that doesn't seem satisfying, then it seems to me the response that critics of abortion should have is it's impermissible to abort by those methods, but it's permissible to abort by methods that involve removing the fetus intact. Um, I'm not aware of anyone who's taken that position, but it seems to me that's where the argument would go. We uh, are coming down. We have actually only about three to five minutes left. So I'm going to... Um, request that um, we, you ask, uh, maybe, perhaps we might have time for three or four more questions, but that's all.
and I'm just choosing them randomly. I'm trying to abide by a certain amount of gender equality here. Hi. I was just wondering, you said that the baby wasn't worse off after the abortion, um, that, you know, that, the, that she wasn't created, but most abortions are done between 8 and 12 weeks. So indeed, if you kill that child, it's worth off. It's worse off than it was. It was living, and um, now it's not. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, this is uh, that's a very good question. That's a fair question. Um, this is partly, I think, the difficulty of trying to compress a kind of long argument into a, a fairly short space. But um, let me try to be a little bit more uh, clear here. Um, the argument was this: if you have already done an act that has made someone worse off than they were previously, then you incur an obligation of compensation, okay? If Chad makes me sick, then he has to make me better, okay? My argument was this, conceiving a fetus that will then die does not make the fetus worse off than if it had never existed, okay? It's not worse to be conceived and then not brought to term than never to be conceived. And just to repeat quickly, if you disagree with that claim, you think it's far, far worse to be conceived and then not brought to term than never to be conceived, then again, it seems to me you must be committed to the view that women that are prone to miscarriage may not have intercourse. And it seems to me that uh, a great many women are prone to miscarriage. Professor, thank you very much. Uh, my one part observation, part question. I'm sorry, who you just? I was just you. Okay. Uh, the, the harsh observations that I think became most evident for me uh, during the gentleman's uh, bringing up of child welfare laws, um, I think inherent in all the questions being proposed to you is a concept that needs to be added on at the end, ceteris paribus, all things being equal. Because it seems that when the question is posed, a lot more uncertainty and, and extras are added into the argument as it's as it's worked out, as opposed to going with the core argument as it was originally proposed, proposed ceteris peribus, all other things being equal. To go back to his example of child welfare laws, there's another broader scope of laws called Good Samaritan laws, such as if you're walking down a beach and you see someone um, drowning, you have a responsibility if you were able to swim, all other things being equal, otherwise calm conditions in the water, to go and try and help that person and keep them from drowning. All other things being equal. Um, the same thing with child labor laws. All other things being equal. If your child can otherwise sustain themselves, is it really morally acceptable to lock them out on the fiercest and coldest winter days in New England and to not let them in? Don't you have a moral responsibility to open the door to your child and say, it's cold out there, come on in, warm yourself? Sure. Um, yeah, look, um, l let me just say this. Um, here, here's three things that someone might be able to do in some situation to save someone's life, okay? Toss a life preserver, open a door, let them stay in their body for nine months with all the symptoms that are involved in pregnancy, okay? I have lots of friends who are very, very happy that they have children. I'm very happy that I have children. My wife was very happy to be pregnant. She had a pregnancy that by all medical standards was very, very modest. Okay, she found it extraordinarily difficult to deal just with the nausea just during the second trimester. As much as she wanted to have that child, there were times when she said, I just don't know if I can take this. Okay, so what I would say is this, if, if we're willing to accept laws that say you must save someone's life even if it means donating bone marrow, giving a kidney, some of your liver tissue, okay, if we're willing to accept Good Samaritan laws of that sort, then I agree. Laws requiring women to carry pregnancies to term, except perhaps in very rare life-threatening cases, would be perfectly consistent with that. Okay? However, the Good Samaritan laws that you're referring to all contain clauses to the effect that it's only in cases where the effort required is extraordinarily minimal that someone can be punished. And by the way, the punishments are quite mild <laughs> in these cases uh, compared to what would be a punishment for murder, for example. Okay. Well, I think I'll have to say, to keep um, faith with the original announcement, uh, one more question and we'll have to. I'm sorry, is it Professor Bill? Sure. Um, <laughs> I'm just wondering if um, 
I think you said that um, you have a right to this continue life when it's making demands on your body. I'm sorry, say it again? Did you say you have a right to this continue life when it's making demands on your body? Yes. I don't, I don't know if I would want to say that in all circumstances. So um, can I just try to quickly clarify, and then I'll let you continue your question. Um, and here's another sort of example. Um, suppose when Chad wakes up, what he discovers is, I just need five more seconds, OK? Just let the marrow continue for five more seconds, and I'm going to live, OK? Um, then I think a law or a moral principle saying, you just got to let him have the next five seconds of life support, um, like a law that says you got to open the door, toss the life preserver, um, I think that, that might be reasonable. So what I meant to say, although I admit I may not have said it, was um, in cases where allowing continued bodily support basically means several months of all the sorts of demands that are put on the body of a typical pregnant woman. That's what I meant to say. Um, I guess I'm just thinking, I'm pregnant myself, and I'm feeling lots of kicks, and I had awful nausea. Yeah. And I thought to myself, how can the human race be perpetuated if women have to go through this misery? Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I know it's not a cow in me. I know it's a baby in there. Um, and I'm looking forward to embracing and having this baby. Um, but what my question is, with regard to life support, if someone were to have a baby, they have the child, after two years they've decided, okay, I'm going to keep, I'm going to have this baby, and the demands of this two-year-old who's throwing its tantrums are causing a lot of harm to that person, causing a lot of inconvenience, and it's just, at that point do they say, at this point I'm going to discontinue this life, and I want to kill it, and Right, I have right. a legal right to that. Right, right. Uh, so, um, I mean, I have a two and a half year old, and so what you're saying is quite a point. Um, yeah, let me, let me try. I mean, um, let me say this. I'm going to say two things. Um, and, and I apologize if the first thing is, is, comes across as condescending. I don't mean it to, to come across this way. Um, here's something that I do think is true, okay? Many arguments in defense of abortion come very close to entailing that infanticide is permissible if they don't outright entail that. I do think that's true. I personally think that's a big problem with many arguments in defense of abortion. Okay? However, okay, the argument that I presented, it, again, it seems to me pretty clearly doesn't have that implication. Okay? Here's what you can do with that two and a half year old if you want. Okay? You can put it up for adoption. Okay? You can let someone else take care of it. Okay? So the claim that while the woman is pregnant, she has the right to decline to provide it life support, does not in any way entail that once the child has been born, she has the right to kill it, okay? Because the argument was resting on, <laughs> deliberately, a very restricted principle that, as I think we saw at the beginning of the evening, virtually everybody accepted to start with at least, okay? When it comes to using my body to keep someone else alive, I get to decide whether or not to be a good Samaritan, okay? Once the child is alive and someone else is willing to keep it alive, I don't have the right to then say, I don't want you to keep the child alive. Okay? And so, actually, now, now that you've uh, put the question that way, let me make one final comment about that. Um, suppose the following technology were developed. Um, a pregnant woman could have the fetus removed, and then someone else who was willing to carry it to term could have it implanted in her. Okay, so say there's a woman, maybe someplace over in this part of the room, she's pregnant and she doesn't want to be. She says, I don't want to carry this pregnancy to term, I'd like to have the fetus removed. If there's someone else who's willing to have that fetus implanted in her and carry it to term, then it is an implication of my argument at that point that the woman over here would not have the right to kill the fetus, she would have the right to have the fetus removed, and then if somebody else was willing to take care of it, that would be fine. Okay, as things stand now, and this is why I believe we have the very regrettable dilemma of abortion. Women who are pregnant prior to viability do not have that option. If they wish to discontinue providing life support to someone that they do not want to provide life support to, there is nothing that can be done. That individual is going to die, as was in the case with Chad and I. Folks, thanks to the intercollegiate Studies Institute, thanks to our two speakers, and thanks to all of you for a fine session.